started. Welcome to our Teaching Effectively in Canvas workshop series. This is the social learning episode. My name is Karen Spader. I'm currently a project assistant in faculty engagement at Academic Technology. I'm also a doctoral student entering into my, what is it? I guess this will be my third year uh, in curriculum instruction. My emphasis area is digital media and I'm studying online learning. So my name is Karen once again, just to reiterate that. And I'll be leading you through today the social learning workshop. Uh, we'll be talking about a variety of things, but before we get to that, I want to get to know each other a little bit. So you all have the pink sticky notes, and you should have your name and your department written down already. I'd like you to next write down very briefly a couple words. Why are you here? What do you hope to get out of today? And then after you've written down those couple of words why you're here and what you hope to, or what you hope to get, the last thing I want you to write on here is just something about you. It could be a hobby, it could be an interest, it could be something you're working on, anything about you. Most embarrassing moment. <laughs> All right, looks like everybody's gotten down their personal quality trait insights. Okay. Adrian, is it? Yes. May I borrow you as a volunteer? Sure. May I borrow you as a volunteer? <coughs> All right, stand up, please. Yes. Our next step yeah. is grab your card. Okay. Our next step is you're going to find someone, it doesn't matter who, partner up with somebody, and you're going to introduce yourself based on your card to each other. So I will tell Adrian what my card says. I'm not going to divulge it yet because then you'll already know. And he'll do the same, and then we will switch. Sure, sorry. <laughs> and we'll switch and then we'll go find someone else. And now I come and I find Anna. Now I have to tell Anna about Adrian and she's telling me about whoever's card she has now. And then we switch again and we find someone new. So the point of all of this is you have to listen good from the get-go because you'll be introducing someone different each time. Okay, you're not introducing yourself each time. Any questions? We take notes. <laughs> These are all the notes you get. Good question. Huh? All right, so stand up. Just grab someone next to you. I'll start with you since so you're so kind of yeah. here. You can start. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. So thank you very much. I hope that you've all been able to meet a few people in the room. Break the ice a little bit, warm up, move around, smile with each other is always a good way to connect us. So, uh, today's session objectives, three main ones. First, to think a little bit about why it's important to foster collaborative social kinds of learning experiences in our classrooms. The second one is, more practically, what are some strategies for facilitating effective discussions in Canvas specifically? And then the third is thinking a little bit about how you can design collaborative activities for your class, your classes using Canvas. We'll actually uh, work together to, to, to think about how you might do that and get some experience in doing that. So to begin though, we're going to start off with some thought. What makes for a good discussion? Good discussion. And you don't have to limit yourself to thinking online discussion. It could be an in-class discussion. It could be a personal discussion. But what makes a good discussion good? So you can think about classroom examples, maybe what you've seen, what you yourself have done or tried, what you've heard other people have tried, or even think about in a perfect world, a perfect discussion, what would, what would be the uh, aspects of that perfect discussion? So I want you to just take a couple of minutes, jot down some of your own ideas, answering this question, what makes for a good discussion? All right, I think everybody's got at least a couple of ideas down. Now I want you to turn to the person, or it seems like we have some uneven numbers, or two people next to you, and compile, share your list with each other, compile your top three together. Okay, so our next step, if you haven't already logged into Canvas, go ahead and log into Canvas. I'm going to flip over to that right now. So in Canvas, if you've already uh, logged into our course, then you'll be in the same spot. If you haven't, 
you should have an, uh, a invitation right in that Canvas homepage when you log in. So it's canvas.wisc.edu. And right at the top of your dashboard, there should be a little box with a green accept button. Or you should find our course is Teaching Effectively in Canvas. But if you haven't already, you can click on the social learning link. And now uh, you'll notice this page might look a little different from what you're used to, but right at the top there's two tabs. If you go to the Apply tab and click on Collaborative Slide, we'll take you here. I see some people have already found it. Wonderful. So if you'll enter your top three into the Collaborative Slide, it's going to get jumpy and crazy. Just go with it. Be flexible. <laughs> Which tab did you say? Um, I'm sorry? You said to click on one of the tabs? Yep, the apply tab. And then collaborative slide. Yep, and then have your small group put your top three on the end of that slide. All right. So I'm just going to blow this up so we can look at it here for a moment. Stuff fails on Firefox for me that are worse than Safari. Hmm. I don't know what to do. I don't, I use Firefox sometimes, but I usually use Chrome, so I don't know. I, th I feel like I've heard lots of people have problems with Safari. Is that what they have problems with? No, people have problems with Safari for some things. They have problems with Chrome for some things. And they have problems with Firefox for other things. I see. <laughs> so, so there's no answer. Become multilingual. <laughs> All right. So to go ahead and just take a look at what the different things people thought of were. Will we have access to this? Yes, I will be sharing it at the end of the session. <clears throat> and actually, from the two other sessions that we've had, I'm going to compile them all together and make them a little nicer looking. So you'll have everybody. <sighs> Open to a line. So I'm seeing lots of really great things on here, all things that are alluding to stuff that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Everything from uh, clarifying the details to allowing people to share their views, being open, diversity of views, moderators, uh, engagement, conversation that is not judgmental, discussion that has an outcome, which is a really good one, set up and not directed by the teacher, that's another one we'll talk a little bit about. Wonderful. All right, great. So lots of good ideas, and I think the key, to take, the key takeaway here with that is to recognize that there isn't one way to have a good discussion, right? And for that matter, there are a lot of things involved when we think of what a good discussion is. So the first thing I'll say, which is a kind of fair warning, don't think that I'm gonna give you a magic bullet to design the perfect discussion and every discussion that's designed that way will have wonderful outcomes. The reality is it's best to have variety, different types of discussions that have different kinds of outcomes or foster different kinds of skills. So the first thing uh, we want to talk more specifically about is why. Why should we emphasize social learning in our classes? And this really gets at some of the theoretical foundations of how we learn, right? So generally, I operate, not everybody agrees with me, but under the constructivist learning theory. So we have educational, psychological, sociological theorists who all talk about how we learn best when we're involved in interaction with others. So we've got Dewey who points out that our learning, all of our learning occurs because we do it with other people, in relation to other people. Uh, Bogotsky, sociology, points out the importance of having scaffolding, the supports needed when we're learning things, but that those supports need to come from and be kind of alive with other people who maybe have a skill level a little bit higher than us. And we should recognize the value of the diversity of skills and abilities that our students bring to the table and foster those skills. Let them capitalize on those skills. Let them use them and show them to each other. And we can learn from each other. All students can. And then we've got some psychology, Albert Bandura, who focuses really on that modeling, imitation, observation, and how we develop our skills better and better. So what does this all mean for the way that I'm teaching? Any one of us. Thinking about how your kind of traditional lecture approach, I talk, you absorb, and then regurgitate on a test or in a paper, 
How do those traditional passive learning environments differ from a more social, active, collaborative one? What are some things that you would see that would be different? I would say that the faculty member is more of a partner with the learner. It's a shared experience versus I'm up here and you're sort of good. Yeah. Yeah, so sharing the experience, I think that's really important, absolutely. Others? Well, the knowledge is not only the one that the teacher is teaching. I mean, everybody shares the knowledge, and some of the students have the knowledge. And mm -hmm. I feel they, they feel very good about this. Right. And when we design social learning experiences, I think we need to remember that people can bring other things. And as an instructor, it's important that we provide our expertise in some supports or some scaffolds, as, as Vygotsky would call them, but that we let students take a driver's seat to some extent, which somebody mentioned on one of the aspects of a good discussion as well. Other ideas? I have to say that I think there's, there's a cultural bias <coughs> in what you're proposing. I, I teach almost half a year in China, and there is none of this collaborative learning. And I, encourage, I try and encourage it because I believe <coughs> this is my educational culture too. Um, and the this, this students get it eventually, and they, they, uh, they, they try to collaborate, and they, they, they work uh, OK together. But they much prefer to sit and listen to me. Uh, lecture. That's that's their preferred way of learning, and they learn very effectively. And I see Chinese students in my classes here; they don't participate much in uh, in our discussions, whereas you know the, the, the chatty American students do. You know, uh, nevertheless, I think right, my Chinese students are learning just as well as my American students. So I think I think there's a question of whether you know th this is part of your ideology of learning or not. Yeah. You know? And if you know, if you're not part of you don't have that as part of your idea, but you learn it then. You, you learn it in a different way, not necessarily collaborative. And I, uh, I definitely agree with you on the cultural bias aspect of how we learn and what our kind of expectations for learning is, are, is supposed to be like, right? Uh, I would also add, as you mentioned, American educational ideology kind of approach and this social collaborative approach to learning. For students that come here from other cultures can benefit perhaps from that exposure and from that development. And I would say as a student in courses with Chinese students, in particular, given the example, how much I'm able to learn when I have conversations with them because they bring a different perspective and how valuable those, educate, those learning experiences have been for me and how much they could be for other American or other cultural students. Um, but yeah, and I think then it's further important then to make sure that our that we provide for our students guidelines. This is how you go about doing this. These are what my expectations are for engaging in this collaborative experience, and these are the kinds of behaviors that I would expect you to do to be meeting my expectations. So yeah, I think that we can't just assume everybody's going to know how to do it. And that takes us to the kind of next section here on the engagement framework. So the engagement framework was created by, uh, I believe the title was the Director of Student Engagement, oddly enough, right? Um, but it was at the university of, a regional university in Australia. And it was designed originally with a teacher education online program in mind, but recognizing and, and their general enough elements that they can be applied to any discipline any year level at a program macro level or a course or even unit micro level. So Pitaway, by the way, is the name of the person who, did, who came up with this framework, recognized first of all that we all, we teach and we learn in a context, right, in an environment. There's all sorts of things going around us. And that might be our culture, it might be the issues, personal things that we're dealing with, right? You know, many of our students work, many have families, right, of their own. Um, most belong to families as well. <laughs> um, but there, so we all teach and learn in a context and in a broader environment. But she recognized that she was looking through the engagement literature and thinking about how do students engage. She recognized there are these kind of five 
what she calls non-hierarchical but interrelated aspects of engagement. So to first start about understanding how do students engage, and once we can figure out what are the different ways that students engage, we can start to think more uh, purposefully about how we <coughs> design, again, either programs or courses or even units or exercises. So we want to first ask, where am I on time? Am I doing all right here? What, how would you define student engagement? What is that, what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be engaged? Participating? Being present? Having a degree of enthusiasm. Okay, having a degree of enthusiasm, I like that. I would say curiosity as well. Okay, curiosity? Connection. Connection? With myself, my life, my experiences. Okay, good. So there's a variety of different ways. Of course, part of it is doing, right? Just the very act of being there and doing. But none of us, I'm sure, would end at saying, I've got a discussion board, and as long as you post to it, you've been engaged, right? It's, of course, not that simple. It does require connection with the material and some semblance of enthusiasm, right? I mean, I don't think we are, any of us expect every student to be terribly enthusiastic about every uh, learning activity we design, but we can vote for it, right? So she points out that, I, as I mentioned, these five different elements, and although she calls them non-hierarchical, she does recognize that some are necessary for others to be cultivated. So she starts with the one in the center, the personal engagement. And personal engagement is really about <clears throat> the intentions that students bring with them to the university, to school, and the mindset that they have in their learning. So our students, in a sense, excited? Are they there for a reason? What is their goal? I'm going to read this one little piece for you from that section that I thought was really powerful to think about. She says, when education is seen as a commodity, a necessary means of gaining employment, then learning can be overlooked if at the forefront of students' thinking is the ultimate goal. So if all of our students think about is, I need to get a job, they're not going to be personally engaged with their learning. So we should think about what intentions do our students have, not that linking learning with their future careers is a bad thing, that's not that, but to really engage students at the personal level, we need to get them excited about their own learning and recognize their own responsibility and purposeful action around their learning. The second one is academic, and so she sees this personal engagement kind of at the core in a sense, because really personal engagement is necessary for the others, because if a student doesn't care about why they're in a classroom, they're not going to engage in other ways. So that's a really kind of core aspect of it. Uh, the second one then, we have academic, and so academic engagement is really about the skills and the abilities academically that students bring to the table, to the classroom. So we need to foster academic engagement as well, encouraging students to take control of their learning, have some uh, agency in what they're doing, and to develop academic skills like reading and writing and problem solving. So we can think about that as well when we design units or learning activities of particularly social, because when students are interacting with each other, not only are they practicing their own academic skills, whether it's verbally in class discussion or text-based, perhaps in an online discussion. Oh, okay, I'm like, how did my music just start again? <laughs> uh, but they're also being exposed to the skills that other students bring. Maybe the way that they form an argument, or the way that they cite material, or the way that they went about finding a uh, relevant article. Right? All of those little things, those are academic skills that students can learn from each other by simply by being involved socially in their learning. Intellectual engagement is really about true excitement for learning. She says that the best teachers are those who are passionate and excited about what they're doing in the classroom. And 
She argues that academic is really an essential, academic engagement is essential for intellectual engagement because when students are engaged with their academic skills, particularly if they have some agency and control over what they're learning and how they're evaluating their learning, they're gonna have more excitement, more intellectual engagement for what they're doing as well. Then we've got social engagement, and of course social engagement is really about developing friendships, developing relationships with other students and faculty, certainly, and shall we call it like ancillary groups. Professional is next though, so that's kind of why I leave them out. So social engagement is about finding a way to foster proactive involvement in a learning community. And by having students, this may be particularly important to think about in terms of size. So if you have very large classes, which goes better? A discussion question thrown to the 150 person lecture hall or groups of five discussing said question? Groups of five, right. Because it's really difficult to foster that social kind of community, that learning community, when you have so many people, everybody just feels lost and alienated despite the fact that they're around so many people. And then the last one is professional engagement. And of course, professional engagement really does uh, point to the need to be connected to professionals in the field that the students are going to be entering into. But even outside of professional experience, a very sustained, involved classroom experience can, if you will, substitute here as well. But again, the idea is that we learn, students learn and develop networks that they can then rely on once they're finished with school as well. So another reason to have students engaged in a course is so they can get to know each other for later use. And I also bring in, not it wasn't actually said in this article, but I think another way is to ask students to connect their material to their career fields, right? And getting them to recognize what those connections are, engaging them in the thought of what their profession might be, how this material could apply that way, is also going to be more engaging. Questions about the engagement framework. Right. How do you do it? How do you do it? Well, how do you do what? All of this endeavors. Well, that's what we're going to talk about okay, next hour. Good. Thank there you for go. jumping ahead. <laughs> so I have a question on the bottom of that handout. How might you design, design activities for these aspects of engagement? Can you think of something that maybe you currently do or were thinking about doing? Now that you've heard about this, might alter a little. Whether or not you include all five is a difficult task, so even one thing you might do differently.
they have to network with each other to learn. And so they better start now. Um, and and work and work that way. And it, it really was pretty magical. Um, you know, I think that one thing to recognize is that we have a tendency to get, and I'm guilty of this too, so focused on delivering our content, we forget to take some time to talk more generally about what we're doing here. Right? We walk into our classrooms on the first day, we say, here's your syllabus, this is what we're going to do, let's jump in. Without ever taking a moment to say, why are we here? What's the benefit of being here aside from the content itself? And networking, sharing diverse perspectives, <coughs> growing and learning from those sharing opportunities, and taking time to give and think of, prior to this, think about it on our own. What do we want to have students get out of our class aside from content, right? Aside from that material. And I know we only have so much time. I recognize that that's difficult. But Pitaway talks about how it's not just the student's responsibility to take control of their learning, but it's also staff and faculty's responsibility to create environments that are conducive to facilitating engagement. And so I think that if we do come into the classroom and just jump right in, we're not doing any of that. We're not laying out what ground rules there are or encouragement or even exploring how do we learn. You know, I mean, I'm in education, so I know a lot about how we learn, but even people who come to these sessions don't have education backgrounds, right? And not that we all need to get one to be good teachers. I definitely don't think that. But I do think that even coming to these sessions and just a little bit thinking about if we learn well in, relate, in collaboration with one another, think about that and have a, I hate, dare I say, mini lecture <laughs> on why engagement is important. Um, and thinking about getting students to think about their own mindset, right? I had the word mindset up there with personal, but I didn't really talk about it. So Pitaway there talks about Dweck's research on mindset and growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Students with a growth mindset, they take challenges as an opportunity to grow. When they struggle or quote unquote fail at something, they don't see it as failure, they see it as them learning. Whereas people who have the fixed mindset think, well, I'm either smarter or not. I'm either going to get it or I'm not going to get it. And she recommends as an important place for advisors and orientation committees to tackle that kind of mindset thing and get students thinking about how failure isn't evidence of your stupidity, it's evidence of your growth instead to kind of change that mindset. But it's something to think about. Because we're, we are, we're trained to shut up and listen, right? I mean, it's very common. I'm kind of excited because there's something in technology that I haven't tried yet, but I'll share with you, and I hope it becomes part of the topic. Eric Mazur at Harvard when he teaches physics wanted to solve this problem. And so he decided to have groups of three, usually in a row. And so the, he spun off a company which called Home Catalytics and research and competitor to the top of that audience response. The cool thing about it. Seating signs. So you set up your class the seats the way they are in the class. And you can have it automatically drop the students in your seats. And then it tells them by their mobile phone where to sit when they come in the door. <laughs> uh, so, for example, I teach a mix of astronomy, physics, AMP, and physics majors. A class I'm teaching. One of the things I was going to say, if you've ever been asking this, but it's like, you know, I should make all the AMP people sit together. <laughs> and then all the physics majors. Sure. And others, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, and then mix it up, yeah. right? So that they yeah. don't do that, but they get the, they must be one socially in there to be connected with their other A and E teammates. Yeah. You know, you the first year students, they don't even know who they are, mm -hmm. right? So being them. <coughs> I could do this trivially with, with but how do you, how do you do that? Way. So how do you, so a student comes in the room and says, uh, they're out there, their phone says, sit, 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 sit there, and it shows them the map. Oh, really? And you can drag oh, and okay. make the map. You just kind of drag around to suit whatever room. You can do it for this room. And you just and so you set that up once. 
and then you just assign them seats and they have to tell us where to go. It's kind of like going to, you know, when you go, go to dinner at a wedding and you've got mm -hmm. your seats assigned, you know, because yeah. someone thought about that. Yeah. It's like, uh, those so two people, nah. Uh, go put yeah. them in. Right. <laughs> right. A so possible can do low tech it. solution to that, we get, uh, we get um, rosters, right? You can figure out what department students are from in the rosters. A uh, string and a paper, folded paper sign might do the trick there some too. If you find you have large groups of liked schools yeah. or majors, depending on your size or what you break it down. You see everybody yeah. who sat in, the person is missing and that's only a twosome. Mm -hmm. You just go drag and they're automatically assigned and pulled to the app to, the, to talk to. What's the app called? It's called Learning Catalog. It's a Pearson, Pearson bought it. Yeah, great. Okay, well, we are at our first 10-minute break, so at 6 after, we'll get started back again. We'll look at some examples in Canvas uh, and a, another model for designing and assessing discussions. So I know my view looks a little different than yours because you're enrolled as students in our Canvas course, uh, but I'll point out a couple of things just so you're aware of it as faculty. Uh, these that are lightly grayed out, obviously you don't see these from your view. So it, from as a faculty perspective, these are tabs that are available. I just have them shut down to keep away from students. Uh, but anyway, so just so you know, if you click on the home button, you do have that. You'll notice that uh, right here is a bunch of different examples all from our active teaching lab over the past semester that was spring 2017 these are also what we have on the tables over here these are links to all of those so essentially what these are are various canvas tools and active teaching lab we have instructors come in share their stories about what they did how it worked what they might do differently so we link out these are all links to activity sheets or the journal there's both there. both uh, so, oh yeah, you can link to the recap, which has videos of their presentation and then the kind of hands-on time that followed that, and then the activity sheets themselves. Uh, and those activity sheets give you kind of how to, step-by-step, -step, set things up and use the different tools in Canvas. Okay. We have the hard copies of the activity sheets back there, if you want to quick see what they look like, see how they work, that sort of thing. The electronic version I would recommend because they all have links that you can click on and the links on the hard copies start working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, next I want to shift and start thinking about what do we, what should we both assign and assess in an online discussion to make it productive, to make it effective essentially. So I'm just going to try to quick count and hand these out for you. Did I forward my thing here first? There we go. So what I have here is the productive online discussion. And what's coming around is a handout that describes each of the different elements of the productive online discussion model. So essentially what happened here was this model was designed after looking at the, let me back up one more step. Increasingly as technology improves and expands into everybody's hands, both online courses, but also using online as a supplement to face-to-face -face courses and having discussions to foster learning are becoming more and more common. And so the people who developed this, um, let's see, Gao Wang and Sun were the ones who developed the model, and then we'll also be looking at another article from Gao Wang, uh, Zhang, and Franklin that actually looked at studies using different kinds of discussion environments. But anyway, they developed this model after looking at the literature on online discussions. What do people do? What do people assess? What do they assign? How do they try to achieve learning in online discussions? And they found that there was typically three main approaches. The first one is the discuss to comprehend aspect. So with the discuss to comprehend, Really what, what they were finding was that some discussions emphasize cognitive processes, right? Interpreting information, elaborating on information. So essentially from the cognitive school of, of, of thought, people learn by working those cognitive processes, right? So you can see on the handout there, which I should 
that one of those in my head. Discussing to comprehend is having students actively engage in those cognitive processes. Interpretation, elaboration, John mentioned connection earlier. So taking new material and connecting it to personal experiences or other knowledge that we have. So that's one aspect of discussions that help students learn that, or at least show evidence of learning. The uh, next one is to discuss to critique. So this comes from kind of the research of the approaches to discussion that really focused on argumentation, ultimately. That the thought here is that we learn when presented with conflict. So it creates this disequilibration. Is that a word? Does that work? We all know what I mean by that? Um, disequilibrium? Anyway, so we're present, we have knowledge. We're presented with new knowledge that causes some kind of conflict, right? We don't, it doesn't fit the way we had everything made out in our minds. And that conflict then requires us to make adjustments, adapt, and uh, what's the word I want to use here when you bring it in, fold it into your knowledge, right? And kind of evolve into a new understanding. So discussions for critique, carefully examine other people's views. We encourage students to be sensitive to different perspectives, but also encourage analysis, right? We want analytical kinds of conversations going on, questioning, debating, things like that. And then the third area was about the social construction of knowledge. So students engaging with each other to grapple with new concepts, right? Questioning, adding to, refining, adjusting, right? They work together to collaboratively uh, construct that new knowledge. So the nice thing about online discussions is that they not only track the process of discussion, right? You go into a discussion and look back, see who said what and what, how, how, the, how the thing went along over time. But it can also provide evidence of learning. So the last element for the productive online discussion model is encouraging students to discuss, to share their improved understanding as a result of these other forms of, of discussion, right? Or we might call them engagement, but that might be using to bring that word back in now after our previous talk. So we should also have students demonstrate in the discussions what they've learned. Some kind of approach to synthesis, right? Uh, in a, explicitly express their improved understanding. We often forget about that part. We say discuss X, Y, or Z, and that's the end of it. We don't have the follow-up to say you discussed X, Y, and Z, now what? Where are we now? What have you learned? So their intent with this model, with they looked at the literature, they saw these three kinds of camps, the cognitive processes, the argumentation form of learning, and the social construction of knowledge. And they, instead of keeping them in their own silos, brought them together to create a more robust model of a, a, a productive online discussion. So. Some kinds of terms, now these could come or go, they cross over, comprehend. So we're asking students to provide interpretations, to elaborate on the information they're learning, to connect with material, to relate it to other, or connect with experiences and relate to other material. For social construction of knowledge, we encourage students to question other perspectives, respectfully, of course, to provide support and even elaborate further on what other people have to say, right? To collaborate in some common goal, problem solving perhaps. And just generally to encourage one another's thought processes. For discuss to critique, we have things like, okay, compare and contrast different camps. Negotiate to a common ground. We had negotiation going on as you guys were coming up with your top three list to put in a brainstorming activity. Uh, to challenge ideas again, respectfully, uh, and to debate complex topics. And then for improved understanding, have students argue a new point that they maybe hadn't thought of or that they have now are able to support given what they've learned. To maybe revise an initial perspective or interpretation. To synthesize an entire discussion. 
or to expand further, given what we know now, how might it apply to a related concept? So that's a lot to think about, right? Particularly for every single potential discussion that you arrange. And certainly there's no need to, well, I don't know if I want to say there's no need to, but we don't have to do that for every single discussion. As I mentioned earlier, variety is a strength. So let's look at further research that Gao led on the, did basically a meta-analysis. If you flip that handout over, you'll see a table, another table, that contains the different studies that were included in this analysis. Uh, gives you the brief author information, tells you what the environment name was, if it was proprietary, and the features that it had, and the goals that it was able to uh, foster for learning. So they gathered all these studies together, and they kind of coded the different aspects of what they were about, and decided, or came to the conclusion of, what I say is three, but they have four here because the last one is combinations of the other three. So three main types of discussion environments. And what I want to do next is just kind of brief overview of what those environments were, but also look at how we can kind of put them into Canvas. So the first uh, group of envir discussion environments is what they call the constrained environment. And typically what these were were threaded discussions, something we're probably semi-familiar with and we'll take a look at in a moment. But those threaded discussions had clear direction. So to go back to the beginning of our session, clear scaffolds, right? You need to do this, and it kind of guides students along what they need to do and develop and learn. So what they called, most of these studies called them post tags or post classifiers or something like that. And it depends on what your goal of your discussion is, but they might be descriptive kind of tags, like this is, uh, this post is about evidence. This post is a question. This post is an elaboration, right? So it would clearly identify what the post content was going to be about or how it operated is maybe a better word. They might be argumentative, so they would be about that kind of critique and the development of, you know, the kind of triggering event, you, which is a question, you present some information, you engage in debate, challenge, questioning, revise, reach a solution, right? might be elements of the scientific method. This is going to depend on your own class content, right? Uh, so some examples of some post tag names. Another option is to allow students to create post tags. Generally though, what they found from these, con these studies that you looked at, constrained environments, was that they were very good at uh, helping students to discuss for con social construction of knowledge and to discuss for critique but that comprehension and improved understanding or sharing of improved understanding was not necessarily addressed. So I'd like to jump us back into Canvas and give you an, exam uh, an experience as a student with a threaded discussion. And again, in our social learning area, if you are at the apply tab, there's a link right there to the social learning discussion board. So I'd like you to jump into that and just go ahead and post something. You can post or you can reply. You'll notice there's a couple of different ways. This is the, at the top is what your prompt would be and the instructions. Students would all see this. Prior to anyone posting, I just haven't been deleting from the previous sessions, nothing would be here and you'd only click here. Or if you want to reply specifically to Scott's post, uh, he's no longer across the room, FYI. Uh, you could click right on his reply. I have a, a couple of additional things. There's lots of different options as you set these up, mm, some different options. You can enable the like ability on the discussions. You can leave it off. Um, Are you going to show us how to do that? Yeah. Uh, set it up? Well, I, you didn't create a discussion. I, I am, but not yet. So yes. Right now, I just want you to get the experience as a student replying to a threaded discussion. But you can think about how this threaded forum, A, in and of itself is quite constrained, right? It's here, it's very linear, right? I mean, you have to go through, scroll, 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 and just see everybody's one after the other. So there's some very clear potential weaknesses there for seeing 
the inner relationship between posts. Yeah. And if you comment oh, yeah. on a oh, comment, yeah. Yeah, so if you comment on, um, on, on Scott's, on Scott's mm -hmm. comment, it doesn't go underneath Scott. It goes to the very bottom of the thread. Uh, so if I were to, right now, if, if I, I were to hit reply to, to Scott, it would post right under you, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, and it's very, they're not clearly separated. Uh -uh. No, they're not. This is the only indication so of a separation if between posts. Scott's made a completely inappropriate remark in the discussion, and you want to call him on it, it doesn't show until the very bottom. Yeah, until you scroll through, unless I was the first one to do it, and then it would be right below his, but yes. Yes, and that's, yeah, that definitely. And that hasn't mm -hmm. gotten fixed yet, has it? I don't know. I mean, I would say no, but yeah, this is what they're working like now. So to think about the constrained environments we were just talking about, now there is, you could embed links, you could embed, although it's not as easy in the full class discussion, you could embed images and things like that. We'll look at another better way to do that in a few minutes. Uh, but thinking about the constrained environment somewhere in here, oh, right here. So this one, you can see, and it's, again, not easy to tell. Maybe I could highlight it in yellow, and that would be easier. But in bold, I wrote the word challenge. And mimicking that kind of post-tag constrained approach to a discussion. At the very top of the discussion, there's a spot to search. And you could type in that search bar, post tags, right? If you have clearly assigned post tags and say, so I'm going to search for all of the people who posted challenges, for all of the people who posted evidence, for all of the people who posted questions, right? So you can think about how that search ability of the, of the threads might be useful. So you, there's no tagging facility, you're just going to make separate right? That's right, yeah. All right, so that's what your standard threaded environment looks like. And by assigning these kinds of clear direction, the use of post tags, you can that it can really operate as a scaffold to help students know what to be doing in that discussion. And it can make them more productive as a result, right? Rather than saying just a general question, it's free for all, you say, okay, this is your topic, these are your post tags, and then they'll know how to approach that discussion better. Yeah. Um, is constrained and threaded discussion here the same kind of thing? I would say yes and no. I would say <coughs> a constrained environment is really about the clear guidelines. It could be in a threaded discussion, but doesn't have to be. And a threaded discussion may or may not have the constraints. So yeah, both yes and no. It's all about how you design the kind of instructions or guidelines for the discussion thread. We have so a faculty member who, who uses the discussion tool here in the, the threaded discussions here. Each week he has a Q&A sort of thing for that week's assignments. And he has a new one every week. Rather than have one for the whole course, because if he had one for the whole course, it would be forever to get down to it. So he keeps those in small sort of constrained, if you will, mm -hmm topic is this week's questions. And that's easy you know, for him and his 400 person class to keep track of those questions. And that way the students go there first, instead of sending you an email, 300 of them send you an email, they do it in that discussion form. So that'd be a good way to use Canvas to teach more effectively to, on your side, at least on your end. More, more efficiently. <coughs> more efficiently. Why would you ever use this instead of PLC? Because you don't know enough about Piazza, that's why. Piazza over and use Piazza. Much better. So another environment is the anchored environment. And with the anchored environment, these were using something to anchor the discussion around. Very literally. So there would be a reading and the ability to highlight sections of the reading, or it could be a video, and make a post right in relation to said section of reading or video. So again, if we go back into Canvas, I've got one of these set up for us. 
This one is called, I gotta go back to the page. You go to the home page and link. So the anchored environment. So hopefully I have this set up correctly, but I should have the sharing settings sent to, set to anyone with the link can comment. So if some of you could go in, it's very short, you don't have to read it all, but just practice with it. Highlight a section of the material and then use the comment feature. You should see it pop, hover up after you highlight some of the text. Yeah, but you can see yeah, how I might, whoa, I'm highlight this and then the comment. I'm really low down on the screen. There we go. So this little comment button over there on the right. And I could click, click on that and type something. Oh, over there on the right, there I am. Comment. Just like a Google Doc. Something? That's a Google Doc, basically. And this is a Google Doc, right. So the reason I'm using Google Doc is because it has the built-in commenting features, right? So you couldn't just, the point of the anchored environment for a discussion is that the discussion is very focused on the material. And you couldn't just post uh, a reading, even a PDF embedded into Canvas that didn't have commenting available to it. Now, PDF does have comment feature available, although I'm not as familiar with the PDF, so Google Docs works for me. Um, now, I have this Google Doc embedded in an iframe rather than embedded via the LTI tool. Uh, which we can have a nice long discussion about the problems with that or the benefits of it. But nonetheless, this should work and I haven't the slightest why it isn't for some of you. <laughs> that is a totally new roadblock. Is the Google Docs embedded within Canvas? Is yes, I have it embedded as an iframe, yeah. Does everyone know what an iframe is? No, 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 no idea how how explain what that means. That we have, we have got resources for you to know how to learn how to do that, no problem. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not the problem. The iframe isn't, you know, what you know, once you get the, the link material. Yeah, no, that was an odd faculty too, and it's usually the browser. Yeah. But that's Google's. Yeah. If you do everything Google, you'll be okay. Yeah. So the benefit they found of these anchored environments <coughs> were that they really helped to enhance comprehension and critique. Here, uh, but not as much of that social construction as it was much more about highlight a section, this is what I don't understand, or this is what I want to elaborate on, or this is what I want to challenge. But it didn't foster as much back and forth between students as the constrained environments did. Sorry, Yeah. Is peer grading a support for the student Sure. How do you do that? So and again, we've got uh, handouts and resources on how to set up peer graded assignments. I know how to do that, but how do you do that with this? So I'm using, I'm saying that is another potentially an example of an anchored environment. If you think about what peer feedback really is, it's feedback on another student's work, okay. right? Yeah. So that any kind of discussion that would go on there between those two students would be anchored to the assignment. So I think that's another way another you know, way to think about anchored environments for discussion. But we have to think about how we, what kind of guidelines we provide for those, because a lot of times it's one way only, right? Sure, a student writes an assignment, and you're my peer feedback. You give me feedback, but then I never say anything back to you about that feedback. You know what I mean? So make sure that you take that extra step to say, OK, Duncan's going to give me feedback on my assignment, but now I have to go back and ask Duncan for the questions about his feedback and then incorporate it into a revision. And there we have, again, those, all of those aspects of that productive model, the revision being the shared and uh, improved understanding. So then the third one is it was a visualized environment. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult ones to move into Canvas. But what they had, uh, various studies used different kinds of environments that allowed for basically the manipulation of the relationship of posts, right? We talked about how the threaded discussion is so linear. 
with a visualized environment, it, 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 the biggest benefit is that you're able to see the interrelationships of different posts. And that linear threaded discussion is not good for that. So there's a couple ways we might be able to mimic this. One is to maybe, instead of uh, what we saw earlier, I had, I had the Google slide embedded for the brainstorming activity. Instead of a doc, you could do a slide. The slides are easier to bring in shapes or something like that to create you know, a box here, box there, arrow to connect. Gets kind of difficult and requires some technical skills from our students to be able to do that kind of thing. Another thing is to use the kind of free online mind mapping software to use to foster a more visualized discussion environment. How you go about assigning that and having that submitted, those are, this is lots of extra steps that we have to think through. But I did provide a few of some, a few different links to some mind mapping programs. And now I tried to fix this, we'll see if it worked or not. I also embedded one of the mind maps into a page so I don't know if it's going to work. Last time, apparently, it stopped working. And it seems like today I'm having problems with things working. <laughs> so I don't know. So the first couple of times I did this, it worked fine. And I didn't have to keep logging in. And now, apparently, we're having all sorts of problems with it. But this is the wise mapping link, by the way. Uh, I like wise mapping because it gives you lots of different functionality in terms of colors and connections and all sorts of stuff. This is just a default format for you. I, we've seen some changes happening, and Arrow got added, and some things have changed. But nonetheless, I thought this was going to work really well to just embed it, and all of you would be able to access it. But I see from here already that somebody's got to sign in. Now, this is a free platform. It does have a sign-in barrier, I guess you'd call it. Um, but it's still free to sign up. But this is a potential way of doing a more visualized environment. You could set it up so all that you had was the kind of main topic and then students had to create branches. Uh, you could set up branches and have students fill them in or move them around. So it's just one way to think about what a visualized environment might look like. Yes? When it was working, it would have accepted a single sign-on and would have gone there and did the same thing that you for students. Yeah, yeah. When it, the first time I did this, the very first session we had, it, you logged, you, you clicked on visualized environment, it went to this, you could click right on any one of these and type something else. It was all transparent. Right. The students didn't enter students too, so they didn't Yeah, to yeah, the first right time, that was it. <laughs> so now, now it's yeah, great. yeah, so I gotta got rethink something else. But you can do this in Google Docs, Google Apps as well, and that's something that every student already has uh, access to because they are part of the WISC guide and Google Apps Google It just doesn't have, it's not quite as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then another option is, you know, I, I know this is teaching effectively in Canvas, but nonetheless, there are uh, download options you could down, students could log in outside of Canvas and then create their mind map, download it as a PDF and submit it as an assignment. That could be another option. Yeah. And so um, how, how is this social learning versus just a tool to visualize and map things out? It could be an individual student. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. so how, is this, how is this tool yeah. uh, and, and enhance social learning? Well, it would be used for groups of students rather than just as an individual to map out their understanding of something. So it would be about working together to create the mind map. Say I put a branch over here and you don't think that branch should be over there. And so you say, no, we should do it over here or we should add this caveat in order for it to stay over here. So it would be a collective effort. But they could work in mind map together anyway, right? This sure. Is, it, it, but this is just a form for them to do it online. Right. I think I, I think I think I understand your question. So you're saying a student could do this on their own, but this way, by putting it in the Canvas, it allows them to do it together. Is that what you're saying? Is that true? I think so. Mm -hmm. And they could also do it on a whiteboard at home, take a picture of it, and submit it that way. You know, there's there's lots of ways mm -hmm. to get mind maps. But the the thing that's wonderful is what Karen was talking about that argumentation between. And you remember the this one, the the different elements of, of um, 
Is it for more construction of knowledge? Is it for um, expanding knowledge? Is it for debating knowledge? When that happens within a group, there's all kinds of negotiation and such that happens. Right, no, no, I completely understand that. I'm just, is that specific to Canvas or? It's not specific to Canvas. It's harder to do in some of the other platforms that we've been using in the past. Yeah, and what I'm kind of doing here is to come up with some ideas, to share with you some ideas of what Canvas is potentially capable of, to kind of fit into this. Because if we think about that four-pronged productive online discussion model, what happens here, right? If we start with a topic and students create branches, what they're doing is interpreting, elaborating. If then collectively as a group, they start to change or question, they're engaged in that social construction of knowledge, given that they're required to have maybe a devil's advocate role play in, in the creation or what happened, how it let, got laid out. You have some of that critique going on and then maybe a summary statement or just turning in the end result could be that shared improved understanding. Yeah, Mara, can, can, can I tell me what can get this for you like? That is a no. And so that's something to consider. Thinking about how much do we need to know about each student's contributions. And I think that there are, it's catch-22 in some ways, maybe that's not the best way to frame that, but in some regards, and some research has found this, when you give students control of what they're doing, they're more likely to participate rather than simply having to meet in check boxes, right? Um, so there's that side of it. Uh, another way I've often policed the freeloader situation is to have students fill out a kind of survey on each other, on their group members' contributions. So I have a group assignment and I say, okay, well I grade your final assignment, but each of you fill out it on a scale of one to 10, how well did Allison, John, and I can't see your name. Alberto, one scale from one to 10, and then I average those together. And so John got an 8.7 from his peers, so he gets 87% of the grade. And that's how they, I determine what their individual grades are. That's actually had really, really good results. Students know that the, it, the each other in their team is gonna be determining what they, grade they get on that final, their final portion of the grade. So I found that it actually gets them to. Is that easy to set up in Canvas? You could, yeah, because you could use um, quizzes. You could do an ungraded survey. Right. Uh-huh, and then assign them per group. <coughs> yeah, you'd have to type in the name. Yeah. Our Google Apps would also let you see that revision history of who contributed what, when. Right, yeah, it depends on what you're using. That's one nice thing about Google Apps, is that you can get that rich revision history. However, you have to make sure that students are signed into that doc or slide or whatever as their WISC account or at least identifiable. It's not like long hair 97 <laughs> at Yahoo or Gmail, I should use Gmail, right? So yeah, you have to have something, yeah. I tend to caution folks against tracking revisions so scrupulously because if we're sitting in a group and all four of us are here and we're having conversations, I might be driving, I might be typing into the doc. Other people sure. might be contributing those ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's another thing to consider. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? Right. right. Are you in a completely asynchronous online course? In which case, maybe that is more important. But if it's in-class group work like this, maybe it isn't. Um, another way to do it is to have students play specific roles, and those roles change over time. So having one person be the lead. Um, I had a really great, art, found a really great article for different roles, and of course now I can't remember all of them, but there was a leader, there was a passage master, and that person was responsible for pulling what they deemed key, significant, important, interesting passages from a reading. There was a creative connector role. That person's job was to connect the current material with personal experiences, outside material, previous material from the course. There was a devil's advocate role, we all know what that is. And then there was the summary role. 
And so the person in the summary role was just responsible for summarizing and submitting the final report on the group discussion. And so having those different roles ensures that people engage because they have different things they're responsible for. Um, and actually, I think I even had, oh yeah, that was the one I also used. A, this was a regular in-class group activities we did. So I gave each student a freeloader certificate. And they had one reading that they could turn their freeloader certificate in without any penalty. Um, that actually, uh, not everybody used them, believe it or not. Especially if you give points for them if they turn them in. Yeah, I did that. I <coughs> gave them extra credit if they did. It seems that like there's always freeloaders. Oh, yeah. And there's no way. And there's nothing we can do about that. No. And so yeah. what, what I have done is I, I'm so tired of the complaints mm -hmm. and the people who are being freeloaded upon. Mm -hmm. And so for the final project, I put all the freeloaders in one group. Yes. And, and so <laughs> somebody has to step up and mm -hmm. lead. And a lot of times it's because those other people always took over leading, so they never had a chance. Mm -hmm. But right. like this semester, they all failed miserably. Right. Because they didn't do anything <laughs> before. So the freeloaders, the freeloaders group did not pass. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. For synchronous online discussions, the active teaching lab, Morgan Gernsbach, talked, she pointed to research that says um, that groups operate more effectively when they choose themselves. So she starts off, you can't let them choose themselves because they don't know each other right away. So she assigns them, but then she gives them a chance to switch up. And she finds that all of the like the go-getters will go find each other, and all of the freeloaders will go find each other. And they seem to be happier that way. Um, she didn't talk about them failing, but you know they do it at their own time. Yeah, and I, that uh, evaluating each other is helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the visualized environments brought in another element because it, it just adds to the ability to A, construct knowledge and critique while developing that comprehension. Um, and again, that last part of demonstrating a shared understanding, or share to improve understanding, word salad to jump over, uh, might be another step in terms of now summarize what that experience was. But they did point out, a, a, as you have more very, very complex topics, visualized environments might not be very good because they can get incredibly messy and that just draws away from understanding. So again, thinking about what the task is and which kind of environment might work best for that. So then, as I mentioned, the last ones were combined environments, both of these being very uh, proprietary software. Camille, um, is this one? No, I think that one is himself. but anyway. So the Camille software was a constrained and anchored environment. So it was anchored to material. Some of them, I feel like there was more than one for this one. No, this was the good style, right. So students could add notes or comments, as I call them, to particular material. Those comments, they could add links to either course material, other students' posts, or outside material. And their posts themselves also contain a specific post <coughs> tag. So it was combining that constraint with that anchor. And this particular study found there was much better focus on the topic, which is very common with the anchored environment because all the discussion surrounds that material. There was much broader participation and the conversation was sustained for longer. And the knowledge form was quite similar to that, but it included a visualized element where they would take the post tags that students created and be able to graphically represent them. And when I think about this, I think of, are you familiar with hashtags in the Twitter slash Facebook worlds? Okay, so basically what a post uh, uh, hashtag Hashtag does is a post tag, right? It says, this post is reminiscent of whatever topic. Um, and you could search for a particular hashtag, and all of the posts that use that hashtag would come up, right? It's kind of the way that I think about that. Um, with the knowledge form software, students could upload their own artifacts and anchor conversations to that. There's a lot going on with this, and these kinds of things are not something that we can just 
naturally create in Canvas. They're pretty complex software platforms that allow for moving a post here, or putting it, I want to fit my post right in between your guys' posts, because I think it relates to yours and yours, but it's not separate, but it's not just yours, right? So you can move things around where you want them to be. But this study saw significantly more reflection in comparison to just a traditional threaded discussion, um, and much more awareness of learning, that center bubble in that um, model. So these were demonstrated all four of those aspects of the model. So are there any questions on the kind of generally what, particularly the bubble image, I'll back that up. That. What we mean by these different elements of focus, I guess. Yes. I mean, what, what's a good balance of the student groups interacting with each other and the professor weighing in and monitoring that? Yeah. Because part, part of the, you know, I want, I want to win-win here. I want them to learn more effectively, I, but I also want them to you know, not sap my own time right. when they're doing group time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good question and one that each person is going to have to grapple with individually to some extent. But I will say I've read research that shows that the less moderation, the better. Um, not that it's not important to correct inaccuracies, because you don't want a cascade of inaccurate information going through your class either. Um, so is there a balance? I don't know if there's a balance or not. I think that. <clears throat> I can't think of the name of the study that I read, but what they did was they had like eight small group discussions online. They were all asynchronous discussions. There was a group leader that rotated throughout within those groups. And there was each week the instructor provided uh, formative feedback just in terms of how are you doing in the discussion board. You guys are posting really good ideas. You're asking good questions. And that was about it. So it was just formative feedback each week on how students were doing in those discussions. And grades weren't assigned until the very end. And they were a holistic kind of grade, rather than piecemeal each discussion. So you can think about it maybe in that way. Um, because the other thing we should recognize is that a student's first discussion isn't going to be as good as the last one. Right? We learn the skills of discussion as we go, particularly if it's all online. Um, but even if you're supplementing online discussions for your face-to-face -face classes, you can say, well, you know, I randomly selected four groups to review their discussions, and these are the issues I'm seeing, and these are the great things that I'm seeing. Right? Uh, so I think that particularly online discussions should be seen as a supplement to learning. And I don't think that we should use them as the only evidence of learning. Um, but because of that mindset that I have of them, I think moderation at a low to low medium level is best. But that's my opinion. So. And then in fact, remember the active teaching lab we talked about, um, she struggled with this as well. She came up with the idea of, ha of checking in on each group three times during the semester. And she told them the first time, and then she told them the second time, but she didn't tell them when she did it the third time. And that way, it's sort of a uh, Foucault's panopticon. They never know if they're not, you know, they're not done yet. They don't know if they're done yet, so they kept on producing at that, at that high level. Was it just the third one that got a grade then? No, they all, all, they all got, got, grade. got okay. grades based on the, the discussion. But oh, right, so they didn't know, so, right, got it. Is that, I get it. So the first one was sort of like, Here's feedback on how you can do it better. The second one was, are you doing it better? And then the third one was, you should be doing it better now. So with our last few minutes here, I would like to show you, uh, someone had asked about how to set up a discussion. So if you go to the People tab in Canvas, you should see, hopefully, you only see one tab at the top called Social Learning. Is that correct? Yes, no, anyone? No. Did I hear a no? No, I didn't hear that. 
You don't see it? Oh, go. I'm sorry, it just says groups. My bad. Okay. So groups, of, so there should, if you scroll down, there should just be social learning one, two. Oh, wow, why do we have all of these groups in here? Oh my goodness. There, they're all the way at the bottom because S comes after G. So by your table number, if you guys will just take or three or four, but I only had five, so just do three or four. So if you go in by your group number, uh, you should be able to self-enroll. If you just click on your table number, you'll self-enroll that way. Okay, so once you're in your group, you'll notice that you now have more options on the right and left. And if you click on discussions, you're wanting to see how to build discussions. So it's empty right now because your group doesn't have any discussions set up. So all I have to do is click on the red plus discussion on the right, top right. So here is where you'll enter the title of the topic or what I call forum. And then you'd enter any kinds of instructions you might want to link to a reading or a video or other material. You can embed things. This little carrot here are various external tools. Uh, you could embed YouTube this way or Vimeo. This also would be how you connect to Google Apps. We don't have time to discuss the problem with that. Um, if you're interested in learning more, right, we'll talk about it. You can directly embed or link to material you have stored in Box or Kaltura. Um, so you'd enter any instructions you want. You could link to other material. This now is just your group. But if you were a faculty, this would be pertaining to your entire Canvas shell for your course. Um, and then here is where you will allow for edit replies or not. I can't figure out why you would set up a discussion and not allow credit replies. So it doesn't make sense to me. And this is where you would turn liking on or off. Um, and you could change those settings too. So that's how you set up a discussion. They're very simple. Now recognize the only reason I put you into groups is so that you yourself could have the ability to create a discussion. Because otherwise as a student you can't set up a discussion for the whole course. But when you're in groups, you have a lot more faculty level abilities at the student level. So you can, if you have large classes and you want to set up permanent groups for the semester, you can do it this way. And I set you up to self-enroll and because I knew you'd be at specific tables and you could just click on it and get enrolled. But I could enroll students into specific groups randomly or, or not manually. Um, so it's up to you. Who had their hand out? I'm sorry. I felt like there was a hand out. Okay. Well, so yes. I made a discussion, but it's my discussion shows up for me, but the others are not showing up for me. Uh, have they refreshed? Click on discussion. Yeah, that's my first recommendation. So we should have a discussion? Yep. We should have a type of discussion. Yeah, yeah, if you refresh or uh, just go back to the discussion. So yeah, and again, you're only going to be able to see the ones that people at your table set up. At the, on the screen right now, I just have table fives up to demonstrate so you guys can see. I don't that. see my link. I posted something, I don't see it. So you're looking at her computer next to you. So we are at the end of my official presentation. However, um, I will add we do still have the room reserved for one more hour if you want some more one-on-one -on -one support in setting things up, if you want to have a conversation about the problem with the Google LTI and the Google Apps and the WISC account versus your personal Gmail account, you can have that discussion. 
Also, I uh, usually have been offering to stick around to demo what the Ultra Conference looks like. If you want to think about using that, uh, this might be particularly useful if you use, uh, or if you have online only courses and want some synchronous element. But I've also seen instructors use Blackboard Collaborate or Ultra Conference, same, same kind of thing, for online office hours. Um, but you're welcome to stick around and see that demo of mine or just get one-on-one -on -one support. Uh, but just as a reminder, we do have those handouts. They're on the home page, linked to them, or our bit.ly is the ATL-E-Journal. That has not only spring 2017, but prior two years as well. Um, those aren't specifically Canvas, but there's some interesting stuff in there. So, and I just want to say thank you. Please don't forget to fill out the evaluation form so that I can know how to, what you like, and how to make it better in the future. And again, thank you. Thank you.